Hello and welcome to today's lesson on an introduction to thermal physics, which is part of the thermal physics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to try and understand and apply the concept of internal energy. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to describe what the difference is between heat and temperature, link the idea of internal energy to potential and kinetic energy, and then finally use equations to calculate internal energies, which which links into the following part of the AQA A-Level Physics specification, 3.6.2.1 Thermal Energy Transfer. Now to fully understand the concepts in thermal energy, you've got to have a comprehensive understanding of the particle model of matter. Now the particle model of matter shows the different formations of particles in the different states of matter. Now the particle model of matter is good for approximating the properties of solids, liquids and gases. Now when particles particles change state, the particles that make them up change the way that they are arranged as shown in the following image. Now it's actually better to show the particle model when looking at the movement of the particles as this also allows you to show the energies that the particles possess in the different states. So you can see the movement and energy possessed in a gas, a liquid and a solid. So let's just recap very quickly the particle model of matter. So in a solid the particles are arranged in a regular fixed structure. They can't move from their position in the structure, but they can vibrate. So in solids, we say that there's a high force of attraction between the particles, but little movement of particles. The particles in solids will only vibrate. Whilst in a liquid, the particles vibrate and are free to move around, but are still in contact with each other. The forces of attraction between them are less than when they're in a solid form. So in liquids, there's moderate forces of attraction and moderate movement of the particles. Whilst in the particle model of matter for gases, the gas particles are free to move randomly in all directions with high speeds and there are almost no forces of attraction between them. So in gases, there's very little forces of attraction and very high movement of particles. Now if we understand the particle composition of solids, liquids and gases, we can start to consider the principles of thermal physics. Now as we're working on a particle level, this shows that thermal physics contains many assumptions and many approximations. So we're not considering the idea of nuclei or protons, neutrons and electrons, we're just considering particles as a solid sphere. Now, the assumptions that you use uh, in your particular calculation, which you state in your answer, are just as important as the answer, the answer value itself. All thermal physics is an example of what we call statistical physics. We assume that we are dealing with many particles. Now, when a substance is heated, the particles will move or vibrate faster as the average kinetic energy in the particles has increased. So we can say that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. For example, a substance at 24 degrees Kelvin would have particles on average with less kinetic energy than a substance at 200 degrees Kelvin. Now, as we can show in the following graph, we can look at how the temperature of a gas links to the average kinetic energy or speed of the particles in that substance. So a substance with a high temperature means that the particles are vibrating or moving with higher speed speeds on average compared with the substance at a lower temperature. Now it's important to note that as kinetic energy is a scalar term, the fact that the different particles are moving in different directions is irrelevant, which is why particle speed is always discussed in thermal physics and not particle velocity. Now if we use the Kelvin scale for temperature, the temperature directly links to the kinetic energy and the speed of the particle. So therefore zero degrees Kelvin means that the particle will have an average kinetic energy of zero. Now you can see it in the following particular animation. At zero degrees Kelvin or absolute zero, their particles have an average kinetic energy of zero, they are at rest. So we can say that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. Now we can use classical mechanics because the particle model relies on the Newtonian laws of motion. So from the idea of classical mechanics, we can say that temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy Energy of the particles. So therefore temperature is directly proportional to a half times by mass times by average speed squared. Now there is a physical constant which links the temperature 
of a substance with the average kinetic energy of the particles in the substance, which is called the Boltzmann constant, which we'll look at later. Now, as we go back to this following graph, this graph shows the distribution of particle speeds for a gas. Now, it's important to note that the particles in a gas do not travel at the same speed, and the speed distribution of the gas particles, as you can see on the graph, depends on the temperature. Some particles will be moving fast, but others will be moving much more slowly. But most of the particles in the gas will travel around at the average speed. Now, this is important because it shows us a few key ideas when we look at the different temperatures and the distribution speeds in a gas. So it tells us that firstly, as the temperature of a gas increases, the average particle speed in the gas will also increase. Again, as the temperature of the gas increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles inside the gas will also increase. And finally, as the temperature of the gas increases, the distribution or spread of the particle speeds in the gas will also increase. You'll have, you'll have a bigger difference between the fastest moving particles in the gas and the slowest moving particles in the gas. Now to consider this idea of temperature, we've got to consider at what, te what scale temperature is measured at. Now the most common example in the United kingdom is the celsius scale which was established by giving the temperature at which water becomes ice a value of zero degrees celsius and the temperature at which it boils at a value of 100 degrees celsius now using these fixed points the celsius scale was created so the celsius scale depends on the properties of a substance that we've chosen for our convenience water it's not very scientific it's not very absolute if water was not the most common substance on earth there would be no logic reason for choosing this to base our temperature scale on, which is why we've got to use a more absolute scale of temperature, which is the concept of Kelvin. And this is why measuring temperature in Kelvin is vital in thermal physics. So just to recap, to produce any temperature scale, you've got to use at least two fixed points to make a range of the scale. So the common example is the Celsius scale. The Celsius scale is based on the properties of water. So a thermometer is placed in water when it's at freezing point and we define this as zero degrees celsius the thermometer is then placed in water when it's a boiling point and we define that at 100 degrees celsius so we've got our boiling point and freezing point so this sets the scale of the temperature so we say one is at zero and one is at 100 so the space in between these points is then divided into 100 parts to get one degree now this is a completely non-scientific and non-fundamental way to set a scale so therefore it's a bit of an abstract scale so all temperature scales which are not Kelvin do not have a basis in fundamental science. Now the method used to derive the Kelvin scale was actually derived from fundamental properties of gas. So in 1848, William Thomson, who was later honoured by Queen Victoria and called Lord Kelvin, came up with the Kelvin scale for temperature. So he measured the pressure caused by gases at known temperatures and plotted the results. And for every, every gas, he found a graph like this one. Now, by extrapolating his results, he found a temperature in which a gas, in theory, would exert zero pressure. You can see the points which he's taken experimentally with the dots and the blue line and then the extrapolation back to when it would exert zero pressure. Now it's important to note that for this extrapolation we're assuming that the laws of physics are constant at all temperatures which thankfully is true but Kelvin didn't realize this. Now since pressure is caused by the collisions of the gas particles with the container zero pressure means the particles are not moving and therefore have no kinetic energy. So when the particles exert no pressure with the particles have stopped moving completely and we call this temperature absolute zero. It's not possible to get any colder. Now on the Celsius scale, this temperature is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Now this temperature has never actually been reached by scientists currently. However, it's hypothesized to be the lowest temperature possible in our universe. So this value of minus 273 degrees Celsius is called absolute zero because it's the lowest temperature possible. Now as the Kelvin scale of temperature is absolute, absolute zero is zero degrees Kelvin. Now in the Kelvin scale, the energy of the particle is proportional to the temperature of the substance it is part
part of. So at absolute zero, the particles of the substance are stationary because they have no kinetic energy. Now in this definition, we are ignoring movement due to quantum mechanical effects. So actually a better definition of absolute zero is when we say the internal energy of a substance is only potential energy because the kinetic energy store is zero. So the absolute zero is when the internal energy of a substance is at its minimum. Now, just to clarify, one Kelvin is the same size as one degree Celsius, but the Kelvin scale starts at absolute zero. So to get into your degree Celsius from Kelvin, you would do the Kelvin minus 273, whilst you're getting Kelvin from degree Celsius, you would do degree Celsius plus 273 equals your value in Kelvin. Now this is verified as the line between temperature and gas pressure always cuts the temperature axis at minus 273 degrees Celsius. Regardless of the gas used or the amount of gas used, it always cuts at the same point. Now in the previous statement, we talked about internal energy. Now in the particle model, we should consider all forms of energy stored in a particle structure. Now as well as the average kinetic energy of a substance, which links to the temperature, there is also a potential energy store in the substance due to the forces of attraction between the particles in the substance. So there's a potential energy store between the particles in the substance, which is due to the intermolecular forces of attraction between the particles. And there's also the previously mentioned kinetic energy store found in the particles of the substance due to the particles moving. Now in the particle structure, you've got these two energy stores, the kinetic energy store and the potential energy store. Now we refer to these together as the internal energy of the substance. So the internal energy is equal to the kinetic energy store plus the potential energy store. But it's important to note that it has to be for all of the particles in the substance. So the internal energy of matter is equal to the kinetic energy of all particles plus the potential energy of all particles. So to summarize these ideas, the particles within a substance all possess kinetic energy, which is due to their random motion. The particles also take, contain potential energy due to the chemical bonds and intermolecular forces of attraction holding them together and the bonds within their nuclei. The sum of all these kinetic and potential energies found in each particle represents the body's internal energy. So it is equal to the kinetic energy store plus the potential energy store. Now changing either the kinetic energy or the potential energy causes the internal energy to change. Now the formal definition of, a, of internal energy of a substance is that the internal energy of an object is the sum of the random distribution of the kinetic and potential energies of its molecules. So increasing either the potential or the kinetic energy store or both will result in an increase in internal energy. Now it's important to note that the internal energy store is a combination of the potential and the kinetic energy stores and these stores are internal to the system and they're not combined with external stores. So don't confuse the kinetic energy of the particles with the kinetic energy of the object itself moving. Now, it's important to note that changing kinetic energy changes the internal energy store. Now, change in the kinetic energy occurs when the temperature of the substance changes. Now, by that same token, changing the potential energy store changes the internal energy store of the substance, which occurs when the object changes state. So this leads to a fundamental law of physics, that the change in internal energy of the object is the total energy transfer due to work done on the object and heating. So work done is placing energy into the system to change either the potential or the kinetic energies, which is what we call the first law of thermodynamics. Now when applied to objects, the direction of the energy transfer is very important as it determines whether the internal energy of your object goes up or down. So energy can be changed between particles in a substance. Now if a substance is not heated or cooled, it acts as a closed system. Now a closed system is one where there's no transfer of matter or energy in or out of that defined system, in this case the substance itself. 
So this means the substance has a constant internal energy. Now in this concept, energy is constantly transferred between the particles within a system through collisions between the particles. However, the total combined energy of the particles remains unchanged. So you've still got that constant internal energy. Now the energy of an individual particle can change in the system with each collision, but the total internal energy of the system remains unchanged. So this leads to important consequence of thermodynamics. The average speed of the particle will stay the same, provided the temperature of the closed system stays the same and no work is done on the system. But the internal energy can be increased by heating it or doing work into the system to transfer energy into the system, e.g. by changing its shape. This will cause the average speed of the particles to increase. Now by the same effect, internal energy can be reduced by cooling the system or by doing work to remove energy from the system. Now the average kinetic energy and or potential energy of the particles will decrease as a result of energy being transferred out of the system. So, for example, when a substance changes state, it can change the amount of internal energy in its structure. As you can see here, when you've got, a, when you've got ice, water and steam, and you can see that the internal energy of the substance is changing as it's changing state. Now, it's important to note that work can be done in two ways to a system. Firstly, work can be done to change the kinetic energy store of a material, which will change its temperature. This physics is covered by something called specific heat capacity. And work can be also done to change the potential energy store of a material, changing its state. This physics is covered by the latent heat, and we'll cover these concepts in the next lesson on the course. So let's summarize what we've looked at in today's lesson. Internal energy is the sum of the randomly distributed kinetic and potential energies of the particles in a body. The internal energy of a system is increased when energy is transferred to it by heating, or when work is done on it, or vice and vice versa. So we've got the idea of the first law of thermodynamics. We've also got an appreciation that during a change of state, the potential energies of the particles are changing, but not the kinetic energies. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to describe what the difference is between heat and temperature, link the ideas of internal energy to potential and kinetic energy, and use these equations to calculate internal energy. So thank you very much for watching today's lesson on an introduction to thermal physics, which is part of the thermal physics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.